good. Okay, so yeah, the most most difficult task of the day is probably my name. So it's a French Spanish name. I don't speak any Spanish. I don't speak any French. So we can agree on either German makes sense for that name or English. Let's zero in on English. Is that okay for everyone? I cannot offer any, anything else. So we are uh, kind of stuck with that. Um, I'm doing networking for quite a while. Um, I cannot do anything else, so that's all I can offer. Um, um, the C is, is consistent. It's probably compute or certification or something like that. But um, if you look for, for a new challenge for the winter time, maybe um, going for the latest certification, um, an open networking professional, which is 50% Linux and 50% networking. So it might be valuable for, for for some of you. If you need some 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 more hints, maybe on a over a beer we can we can have a chat. Um, but that doesn't make you a better person, at least that didn't make me a better person. Um, I'm doing networking for quite a while. Uh, layer one problem. Ah um, I would like to start with quick history, a motivation, the scope, what I would like to cover or what is interesting to me. I try to correlate those two things um, in life and um, maybe we can have a chat about Linux networking, maybe we could have a chat about open networking, um, maybe container networking, but there's a whole different um, area of interest, but it's, it's, it's very compelling to, to, to go there because it's, it's the junction between networking and compute or containers and it's not known by a lot of folks so the market is quite quite receptive of those skills and um, it's it's interesting and um, certainly um, I don't like to do things twice so I like to try to automate um, I'm not fixed on on a tool um, but most examples are usually from in our case are written as Ansible playbooks um, however we do have also customers running um, SALT. So I tried SALT and it's working and <laughs> two days ago I tried Puppet and well it's working because in the end open networking should be um, more open than networking. Open networking should be like well caring for your server. Um, ideally open networking should be like like your server. It should be a, in our case a Debian 8 server with a fancy NIC. A fancy NIC could have well one port or 128, 100 gig port somewhere somewhere in between, and um, it should just behave like a server. So, actually, my talk should be very boring. Um, shouldn't be any should shouldn't be special in any case. So, where 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 does a funny person come from? Well, Hamburg, Germany, almost Denmark. Um, I started in a mortgage bank, and we had a lot of machines. Um, the, blue, the black ones were located in the data center, the blue ones were located in the fifth floor where I, where I used to work. So we had two teams really fighting with each other. We had a lot of fun over there and I was responsible for that broken stuff over here. Those, those token ring mouse and um, FIDI and ATM equipment and later bridges and routers. Um, so I was looking a little bit jealous to, to those folks over here which were able to move on with, with Linux. And um, so I asked myself, well, where I am? Um, I'm still at the old place. At the same time, I had my same CLI. Nothing changed for me, really. And those folks went off and they were able to buy their hardware and get an operating system of their choice where they previously had to bundle everything. So they were happy and they could, well, come up with new concepts like VMs and containers and all that stuff. And I asked myself, well, what can I do? Hmm? I'm still using my old industry CLI. Hmm. Nothing new. Actually, I had a small detour over here, so I went to a company, Nisira NSX, and did some SDN stuff. Um, fun. We also had an open stack distribution, but um, I came back over here. So the industry evolved, and I saw all my friends going now for Linux and, for example, Ubuntu, but I'm not tied to that one. Um, I also tried some other derivatives, Debian and SUSE and Fedora and all that stuff. Um, that was one thing that was very compelling to me also. Um, Kubernetes looked very nice along with those automation tools. Now my question is how do I get there? How do I get there with my old well, bridges and routers and switches with our old 
huge chassis which cost more than my house or my flat I'm living in. So, hmm. And one, it's not the only solution, but one solution is to um, get a white box switch and ask the vendor to put a bootloader on. Someone needs to write that bootloader, so some folks in my company did that and put that in the open space. So it's usable by everyone, ONI. And um, with ONI, you can boot your NOS, your network operating system of your choice. Well, that's good. So we have competition, we have different offerings available on the market for different, well, targets. And one of them is that rocket turtle over here, that green one, which is, well, taken off, and it's more focused on the data center space. And it is really nothing but a Debian 8 server with a fancy NIC. And if it's a Debian 8 server, we can use the same tools like we did over here to really include our networking devices in our automated setup. We just have to persuade Linux a little bit to work well in a networking world. It's not, it was never meant to be a networking operating system, so we need to, well, tweak it a little bit. And ideally, tweaking it is nice. A lot of vendors are tweaking Linux, but it would be nicer to upstream those changes for the community. So you can use those changes on your servers over here, but as well as going forward when we upgrade from Debian 8 to Debian 10, are you closing the door so no one is able to leave? So now I can start really what I wanted to... <laughs> we need to talk. <laughs> I'm getting frightened. <laughs> I'm getting scared now. <laughs> when the lady locks the door, you're oh, in trouble. Okay, so, so when you upstream all those changes like um, verbs, um, and you upgrade from Debian 8 to, uh, in our case, 10 in, in, in a while, all those changes are in place. Everything you need is in place. And verbs are a nice concept. Verbs are virtual routing and forwarding tables, right? You can do a tenant-based separation uh, on your networking ports, but you can use the same concept now in your service too. So with, I think, kernel 4, 14 or so, um, it's, it's generally available. So that, that is something nice. So that's where I'm coming from, and certainly that is my area of interest. Not that I'm particularly good in that green box, but it's appealing to me. I like it. Um, I like to spend my spare time with it, and a little bit of working time as well. So um, in order to spend time, you need a playground. And certainly you have to sell that playground too to customers who really want to build a physical network. The networks we build today are leaf spine networks. So we have one, two, or if your SLA dictates, we have multiple spines over here. We have leaves where the intelligence is located. Green links are layer three links. And it would be great if we could set that up in the most simplest way without configuring any IP addresses, but still having a layer three fabric. Magic. There's no magic anymore in networking. Magic was there 20, 30 years ago, but today there's no magic. So every interface has a MAC address. Out of the MAC address, I can automatically generate a link local address, which is an IPv6 address. The routing daemon running over here is willing to send that information out in a route, router advertisement, an array message, so the other side is able to receive the information about layer two and layer three, and is able to set up a session to port TCP 179, which is BGP. So I've automatically created, without really much configuration, a layer three fabric where BGP is automatically peering and is able to exchange information. So with BGP being able to reach every point over here, BGP is also able to announce those IP addresses as tunnel endpoints, and I can control in a controllerless fashion overlays, VXLAN overlays. So if you take one thing back home, routing protocol of my choice would be BGP. You can use BGP for both, underlay, overlay, it's just one session, and I can show you how easy the setup looks like. Actually, our data center fabric might span even farther. And those are our customers over here. Um, all those devices need to be 
accessed by an out-of-band network and we have a server over here with an orchestration tool. Uh, in most cases I will use Ansible but I mean choice is yours. Now that playbook in an Ansible case will deploy from a template configurations and we need some information um, coming in. Um, those playbooks and that information should be stored in a central place like GitHub, GitLab, some repository of your choice, some repository you can, you can reach even if the network is down. Hmm? Hmm? Might be nice to have a local copy somewhere available too. And maybe an IPAM system might be helpful as well. So a lot of my customers are using Netbox or PHP IPAM. Um, one customer is documenting everything with um, Netbox and once it is completely documented it's being rolled out. It's a pretty extreme approach, but they're running a huge um, community network with it. Now, before we put something in the repository, we would like to set up a test environment like Jenkins or something more, more um, up to date. And for that, we also need a virtual environment. And that, would, that should resemble the physical environment. And we provide you with a Vagrant setup. You can you will go to GitHub, um, Google, CL demo cumulus and you will get the Vagrant setup with VX machines which one-to-one -one resembles the physical network. So you can, you can run your playbooks against that virtual network. It behaves exactly like your physical network. And how that is, will, will be achieved we will cover in a second. And then we have some customers down here, some containers, some VMs, some legacy machines. Just because we move to that new world doesn't mean that we we are able to skip all the old zoo which we find in our, in our data center, right? The machines with, with a sticker, don't turn me off ever, 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 your CEO. Hmm? Okay, so um, my playground would be a spine, two leaves, two servers. In my case, um, I have Ubuntu servers running, it was 1804. First thing I did is uh, get rid of NetPlan, but it's your choice, right? Um, don't smile. <laughs> um, and I have some, some, some containers running with a KS-like light environment, just, just for toying around. Just for me, because I'm simply structured, I need to, to sort things out. I could attach the containers directly to the server interface with a Mac VLAN. I'm using that for toying around when I run Docker on my switches and attach those containers directly to my, to my SVI interface. But that is not supported and it's not best practice. You should not use a switch as your container host, right? Just for learning purposes, that, that would work. So that doesn't really make difference. This one is the, the example I would like to, well, I would like to go for. I have containers over here and I have a routing daemon running. It doesn't need necessarily to be FRR. FRR is a fork from Quagga. So Zebra, Quagga, FRR with more maintenance and it's, it's your choice, but if you would pick FRR, you could run the same routing daemon on your networking products and your server products. If you pick a different network operating system, maybe you would then pick a different routing daemon for your host too, but FRR is pretty much used by uh, more and more people, let's say. And um, there are also some people in our company who get paid to develop FRR actively. So it, it would be a good fit. And the last approach would be if the networking department over here who is willing to inject routes into the network is not really working together with the networking department, you could also put that into information into a tunnel and um, tunnel it to, to another container host. So I think those are the three big well, options you have with container networking. And there are some, some dots over here, you, you're never complete these days. You will always find someone with some new ideas or some new offerings. Mm. So let's have a look first about uh, into the OS architecture because on both devices over here, we'll most likely see Linux running. I mean, there are certainly some folks who like Windows, sure. Not here. I used, I, I used Windows for a long time and I like Windows, especially because it offers me Visio as a drawing tool. That's about it. There's always a, a reason to use it. Have you heard of Bluetooth Shark? Yeah, yeah, and I, I stopped completely using them 
those charting tools, uh, to be honest. But I, I, I kind of miss my old Visio or the the feeling I had when I when I when I did the drawings back then. Uh, I, I don't want to go back in time, but it was I connect Windows with Visio mentally, and I have a positive feeling. Oh, I'm sorry. So, but let's let's move to Linux. Um, we have two planes. We have a control plane and a data plane, right? It's a normal Linux server, nothing fancy. We have some user space programs over here, IP tables, a little bit SSH. Um, we have some interface manager, I have up down, we have ETH2, we have a routing daemon, and IP route 2. And we have a blue, blue communication bus, Netlink. It's like a publisher subscriber model with the benefit that the Kernel components can notify also user space. It's not one way, it's, it's two ways. It's RFC based, so Netlink should be well known. We also have a Python Netlink class, NL Manager, you can, you can use for your own Python programs if you have too much spare time and like to toy with something. Well, in the end, with that bus, we can, we can get a prefix over here and inject that prefix into the forwarding information base which is being consulted when the packet has needs to be routed, right? And we can, we can subscribe to those messages with a different process, like that NetQube process, or you can write your own. So you can subscribe to whatever is, is being sent on that blue bus. And that's important when we later want to sync, but this, this little agent in this case is taking that information and is converting that, putting that into Google RPC and streaming that out to a telemetry service. Now this is a setup with a normal Linux server, so you don't need any networking equipment to stream out data about your layer 2, layer 3 networking environment. That's universally available. Now we might have a quad card with 425 gig ports, maybe we have spent a little bit more money and have a single 100 gig interface these days from, for example, some of my customers are testing right now Mellanox. Uh, so we have, we have machines with four or, or multiple um, nice ports, but in general, we, we need in a networking world maybe well, 48 or 60, 64 100 gig ports for a leaf spine environment over here. So we need more ports and we need an ASIC network processor to the heavy lifting of packet manipulation. But those rules, which are located over here, they need to be sent down to that network processor. They need to be in sync. They need to be 100% in sync. And for that reason, another process is being started over here, switch D, which is also subscribing to all messages and programming that network processor, either a Mellanox Spectrum or Broadcom, Trident or Tomahawk right now with the option to add more, but needs to be needed. Now, I will go back one side. This setup over here is just a Linux server. And this setup is, is an open switch. Now, you can use this setup to create and test your configuration. And once it is done, you just apply that same configuration to your hardware box. You're looking through me, right? You don't, you're looking at your next vacation or something. I think it's beautiful, but okay. I will find something which is more interesting. So make you smile. Um, in order to really tell the system what we want, we need, if I were just in pre-sales, I would mention two flat files. But since we are honest over here, it's a technical event, right? We need four. We need two big ones and two small ones, more or less. Um, the, um, the one for FR for the routing daemon is our configuration file. You can find it over here under etc FRR FR conf. And we have a file which tells FRR which daemons to start. FRR comes with a whole range of different routing options like bubble or enhanced IGRP or ISIs or some cryptic stuff, um, we selected, <laughs> you're smiling, yeah, out of those only a handful are supported on Cumulus. Not that the others won't work, but they are not supported, not tested. Hmm. So you can select between OSP2 or OSP3, 
the OSPF version 2 for v4 or OSPF version 3 and I would recommend to use BGP so those are three ch choices BGP OSPF and OSPF and you you select BGP right we agree so BGB is good. So we tell that in that in that little file that we want Zebra, the routing information base, to be available and BGP to be available. Then we restart FRR one time, never touch that file again, and just focus on the big green file. The second one is IF up down. Is it always IF up down? No. Used to be IF. Well, IF. <coughs> It's, a, it's our interface manager and it used to be IF up down in the, well, in, in the other world, written in C, and it was meant for the use inside a server. But that interface manager doesn't really work well for a networking appliance, right? So we have rewritten IF up down to IF up down to, it's now in Python and has some goodies. And when I get an Ubuntu 16 or 18, the first thing I do is I get rid of the interface manager and use IF up down too, even on my servers. You don't have to do that, but it's an option. You might want to do that. And the configuration file is equivalent to IF up down, stored under the same location. And we have also a fourth file which tells the system about breakouts. Imagine a, a box with 3200 gig ports and you would like to break down several of those 100 gig interface into 4 times 25. So you need to tell that via a configuration line in that file and restart switch D once and not touch that little file again. So you're actually working with two big files over here and do the usual stuff that you might want to add some packages like bandwidth, monitor next generation, something you would do on your servers anyhow, add a user, add writes, copy files, etc. That's something you can also do. So th those are our tasks. And just to be honest, if I were presenting those slides, for networking people who were used to Cisco networking, for example, or Juniper networking or Brocade networking, doing that job for 30 years, they would kill me when I mentioned Linux and um, DevOps and orchestration tools. They like their CLI. And in order to help them, we also have the option, or a lot of vendors have the option, to offer in addition a network CLI. In our case, it's NCLU. A new abbreviation you can remember, you don't have to. And all those commands start with net. And you have a tab key as a contact sensitive help. You can ask the system what at that point is appropriate to, to specify. The nice thing about net commands is you have a net example which gives you a text file and a diagram on your box without internet access about example configurations. That's, that's so that you can well, copy a little bit and um, get some ideas how to verify stuff. That's written in an edit buffer. You can take a look at the edit buffer with net pending and with net commit you activate those changes. Now, everyone in the networking industry needs good marketing, right? Building a great product is not enough. You, know, you need to tell everyone, sure, but you also need marketing. And sometimes marketing is difficult. It turned out that Having a networking module, for example, for Ansible with proprietary stuff turns out to be good marketing. So everyone needs an Ansible module for their network CLI. So we also have one. So you can use those commands inside your Ansible playbook just for, to be honest and to be complete. Maybe that is something for your networking folks back home to make them, well, more interested in open networking. Personally, right now, I would prefer the native file, the native file approach, where I have a file, I copy that file, one of those two green blocks to that device, and activate that file. That's me. But you have the choice. It's always good as a customer or partner to have a choice, right, between two options. Don't get confused with too much, but have more than one. Okay, two is a good number. It was the lowest number my director told me in my mortgage bank to order. At least always two. Well, I can comply with it. So what do we really need to automate? We need to automate our network interfaces on our server. We have a placeholder, maybe we have two interfaces, and we need to do 
basically the same for our mini interfaces and on, on, on our switch we do have a routing daemon for example for our routing but we have a placeholder over here so you can have the same routing daemon running also on your server which means all of a sudden you have the same playbooks the same logic the same functionality on your networking gear and on your server so your networking fabric goes into your server if you want you don't have to but you can you can move the routing into your host but you can also move the tunnel endpoints into your host so you can run evpn into your host and you can go even one step farther you can you can use vrfs tenant separation inside your host and terminate the tunnels where they need to terminate and really create firewalls stateful devices with an with different security layers on demand provisioned via well ansible salt public chef whatever okay and they those playbooks they all look the same and boring enough they look like the playbooks you wrote for years for your servers doesn't make a difference anymore for servers and switches you become root you have a name you copy in this case the interface file to the device to the standard location and standard syntax and now you need a little bit magic when you do a configuration change on your network interface of your server maybe you have four interfaces and you reconfigure one what are the other interfaces doing when you activate that change do they stay up depends what you are using Dep if you are using some crazy short trick like five years old then maybe they are going up and down if you are already starting the portion so, but if you are using uh, NMCLI, for example, then it should be pretty fine. So it depends. That's, that's a good answer. And, and we, we might want to agree that we don't want them to go down, especially not in this case where we have 128 100 gig interfaces, right? Otherwise, we will meet a lot of new people to talk to <laughs> when, we leave, when we leave our office, right? Or when we meet next time at the coffee machine. So we need a little bit of magic, and the magic is interface manager used to be um, I've up down can now also be net plan I don't know really whether it's better a better choice or not but the old one had some challenges for the network environment and um, in order to overcome that Julian and Roper um, and maybe also some other folks um, rewrote the interface manager in Python and added some nice features like a dependency graph where the program is looking at those interfaces and is able to see the dependency so it doesn't make a difference where you configure your interface and your bond interfaces if the program identifies a bond interface it looks for the to be enslaved interface and puts and activates them in the right order so that's that's nice it's convenient it makes life easy and bonds are always the challenge between networking and server folks anyhow. So that is nice, but this one over here, incremental changes and query live configuration is available. So with that program, we just activate those changes for the Delta interfaces and leave everyone this in, the, in the, well, activate and, and, and running. Now that is now bundled by default in our networking devices. Maybe other distros have different, well, Interface managers which are able to do the same, but it's 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 this basic requirement, and you can have the same behavior also on your on your on your um, Debian-based uh, machines, Debian or Ubuntu. It's not available on on uh, on Red Hat, uh, CentOS, or Fedora right now. In order to install it, I would recommend not to use apt-get install. I would go for that little example or go to Julian's um, wiki page to install and create I've up down to for your environment fair yes no maybe mm -hmm. okay so the important thing is it's it's not disruptive anymore um, unless for that interface you're changing like if you change the IP address it's certainly um, well, not the old one is not reachable anymore. Okay, so one one uh, example would be we can use sudo ifquery with an 
minus a lists all interfaces running right now and with minus p and list there are a lot of options Julian put in. Um, we also see the dependencies. We see the layer 3 interface which is enslaved to a verb interface which is also layer 3 so we see that dependency. We see which interfaces are connected to that bridge. That bridge can be a traditional bridge or VLAN aware bridge which scales better. So that should be also your choice when you need VLANs or broadcast domains within your switch and it also gives you the dependency for your uh, for your other interface. All right, so that is um, something I can I can also show you from a playbook perspective. Um, it's pretty boring. You copy that interface file from your source from your Ansible server to to that destination, and then you tell that interface manager to reload all automatic um, marked interfaces in your configuration. With that, with that simple playbook, you can configure all your interfaces. That's boring. No magic anymore. The only question is how do you get that file in a very efficient fashion? So if you have 10 switches, you can create 10 files. If you have 100 switches, you might want to go to the university of your choice and get some help to create 100 configurations or spend the weekend. I do have two dogs, I have no time for creating 100 configurations so we need something else. Um, but that's layer 2, that's uh, layer 1, layer 2, that's our interface stuff. Um, we also need to talk about FR and routing and um, yeah so German engineers are not known to be very funny. Sometimes I give it a try. Um, so once I was a time, well, a long time ago I had a cat. Now the association pops up, how a cat looks like, maybe like this. Not my cat. Um, that's my cat. That was, um, back then when I started, it was called Crescendo, the first acquisition of Cisco systems. And it was later on uh, named Catalyst 5000. It's a layer two device with an own operating system, CatOS, beautiful, worked. Great stuff. And over time, someone needed routing. So there was a routing engine put on top, RSM, own module. So you need to, well, session into that module and do the configuration over here with a standard industry CLI and had a second configuration for layer two. It's like today with Linux, right? You have your ETC network interface file for your interfaces over here and you have your FR configuration or your BERT configuration or your GoBGP configuration for your routing. Nothing new. Old concept. 25 years old. Nothing new. And since it's, I, I borrowed that picture, I need someone, something on top. So my little one, he likes um, cat trucks. So I got, uh, got a cat truck. So in the end, I'm sessioning or telnetting. Telnet is not really good anymore, right? Should avoid that. Mm. Um, to that routing engine, do an enable, show run, config t, and with the same commands we used 25 years ago, we can configure today FR. It's the same. So you can take that configuration, router BGP, private autonomous system number, two octet, or today four octet might be better, and configure router ID and your neighbors. Done. So the same approach, nothing new, nothing to be afraid of. If you want more information about FRR, some links. Um, the same folks who, for example, invented and wrote the enhanced IGRP code are now working for us. So a couple of very capable folks are supporting that project actively. And it looks like this. We have different demons working with the Zebra <coughs> API with the routing information. And with NetLink, the, those prefixes are pushed down here. They are subscribed by Switch D and Switch D is programming the hardware, so we have a one-to-one -one sync between those two worlds. Beautiful. No Alibi programming, and Linux is really used in all, with all features. It's not used as a bootloader for, for a blob of code in user space, which, which is doing everything. So, um, in order to persuade FRR to do something, we copy the daemon file, from our Ansible server to the, to the target machine. And in that daemon file, we have two lines. 
and then we restart FR. Restarting is disruptive, so you shouldn't do that when the year ends and everyone gets nervous in accounting and tries to fix the books and, and squeeze the numbers, whatever. So that's something we would like to do on a Monday morning to get a good start for the week. And with that easy setup, we can also avoid maybe going forward layer two environments with a bond interface and layer two connections to two leaf switches. Because if we do that, we need to have a peeling in between and make those two boxes appear as one, which is artificial. Everyone is doing it, everyone is expecting that it's available, but it's artificial, right? It's pretending to be something which is not there. So it, that by itself is a risk. You can do that, everyone is, 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 is doing it, but uh, it would be better, more reliable, more scalable, nicer, if we have separate layer three links. And by putting FR down here, you achieve exactly that. You have individual layer three links, you can remove a link, you can add a th third link. If you take one into maintenance mode, you can connect with third link, uh, a third top of rack switch, and you still have in maintenance mode redundancy. Might be nice for hospital, might be nice for the sea level folks to have a better connection, right? To get their golf books and journeys delivered. So that is um, something we need once and then, um, oh yeah, that's how it looks like. Um, I try to avoid my nano and I use the more geeky professional Vim. Someone pointed that out last time I presented, so I um, feel ashamed and I try to use the colon and the QW more often, but I like nano as well. I mentioned before that I, I used Windows, so uh, it's Hopeless, anyhow. So we need to care for that big green box here. And for that green box, we copy the configuration file with BGP, router BGP, 56,000, autonomous system number, etc. over. And now we trigger a handle to reload, which is non-disruptive, which is just accepting the changes. So we have one, one handle over here, restart, which is, well, working. <laughs> but you should use it only once, and then you have a handle for, for reload. So we have two non-disruptive ways to activate those two configuration files, one for interface and one for routing. Again, boring, right? That's all we need. Hmm. Now, do we, are we good in time? Can I buy time? Yeah? Maybe a beer later on? <laughs> I tried to... Is that okay? Should I should I skip some slides or? No, 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 you're fine. You blame me afterwards. Now he threatened me to have some really bad questions, so I'm I'm trying to avoid that Q and A section in the end. No, I'm kidding. We'll be here. So we have um, we have the traditional way to configure BGP, which still works. So if you want to continue with it or connect to legacy equipment, you can do that. Where you specify your neighbor. So this device over here has an IP address 1.33, has a specific subnet mask slash 30 slash 31. Huh? For networking folks, it's cool. For server folks, depends. Because you don't really know if you don't do it every day, whether 33 goes with 32 or 34, right? Hmm. So it, it exposes a lot of risk to specify the remote IP address. If you want to script that, you need to ask the IPAM system to give you the remote IP address, which is complicated. And you also need to ask the IPAM system to give the remote autonomous system number, which you don't really use. You just compare that with your own number and come up with, oh, they are the same or they're different. So you need that number, you don't need any of those numbers really. So you have the choice now with FR, even if you just use it in your Ubuntu environment without any switch, um, you can configure BGP unnumbered, which means you tell the system where you want that session to be leaving your, your, your box via SV, SWP2 or ENP, 0s9 in my other demo, and you tell 
you expect the other system to have the same or a different autonomous system number. If we can reach someone via that interface, and if we haven't configured MD5 because we are paranoid, we set up a BGP session automatically. And those interfaces over here, they don't have any IP address configured. So that is all you need to configure BGP today. You can do it traditionally with interface and with all that stuff, still works. So if you need to show up, show off in your company to make it look really difficult, use this one. If you make your life easy, that's your option. All right, so that's good. We can talk over a beer how it really works. Link local addresses, IPv6, IPv4. We are fixing something in the kernel for you as well over time. Um, but in the interest of time, that's something we want to create now. We want to create a leaf spine environment and we are successful with our business. So we have more than one data center. We have more than one row of switches. So we grow and we might have a second set over here. We need to well, connect them together with some exit or border switches and we can connect them with a super spine. So that is our target environment we want to set up. And then we have some customers down here. And for them, I would, I would envision that we extend our fabric into those hosts over time. It's an idea. Not for everyone. We still have some bare metal hosts and some databases. Larry doesn't want us to well, virtualize his Oracle database, right? Uh, some issues. So we still have a zoo somewhere, but that would be my, my idea to design a network today. Leaf spine. Leaf spine, super spine, if we grow, layer, layer three, all links, layer three, without a configuration. Um, all devices have an outband, blue connection, servers, ILO, network switches to reach DHCP, web, analytics, and uh, orchestration stuff. We have overlays to offer location independent layer two services. It's just your choice whether you want to terminate that on the exit leaf or you want to be able to span VXLAN from one side to another data center. Both options are available and valid. Okay, so time is almost up. So what we could do, we could, we could try, um, we could try to, to, to have a look um, into to playbooks if you want to. I have five examples, maybe we pick one or two. Um, that's my leaf spine environment. I have a leaf 01, I have a server connected here. That one should have a 3.101 IP address and I have some Anycast and some unique IP addresses for those SVIs for as a default gateway. Um, I don't see anything. That's my problem. Um, so let's see whether we can persuade the system to to show something. Um, can you see something? Yes, no? Okay. That's, that's my out-of-band management server. So I would create a jump host I can reach from the outside, which is connected to the management network and connected to all servers and to all switches. And this one comes with um, two directories. Um, so I haven't tested it, so it's a live demo. It's worst case. Um, you can all laugh with me and at me, um, depends. Um, Ansible playbook clean leave one. Let's see. It, that should remove everything or at least something from leave one. And let's, let's have a look. Um, and I created the whole environment with that vagrant file I mentioned. So it's available for everyone. The operating system in form of a VM with 760 Mac requirement, pretty small, it's also included. So you can get everything for free. You probably just get some marketing calls from the UK to, to have a nice talk with Robbie and he, he would be delighted to, to help you from that point. But you don't, you're not being charged for everything, for anything. Okay, so we, we, we have that playbook. Let's have a look, um, um, pseudo, 
<laughs> so that that's how it looks like, right? We we just copy that playbook over here and we we reload that interface uh, manager for um, leaf01. Okay, um, SSH leaf01. Um, net show route. Net show route looks a little bit sad. So we have one directly connected interface here. Um, that is our loopback and it should be our our um, VXLAN tunnel endpoint. And that's about it. Do we have a verb net show route VF verb one very creative. Um, the tenant is named verb one and verb one is not active, it's not configured, so it's pretty empty. Um, Set. Let's take a look. Uh, um, Ansible playbook um, EVPN leaf one, maybe. Hmm. That's pretty fast, right? Um, net show route. So all of a sudden I have BGP running, the B denotes BGP. I have learned slash 32 host routes, which are my tunnel endpoints. Um, they're, they're learned via an IPv6 address, which is nice. It's a link local address, FE80. So that works. And maybe I have, an, I have a verb, maybe. And indeed, I have a tenant with the name verb one, could be also Pepsi, Coca-Cola, Snapples, whatever. And I have a, if I had more memory and more CPU, I would have more machines injecting also default route from the internet. But in order to catch everything, I have a one, one kernel route over here to catch the rest. And I have some, some more routes about my tenant machines. Um, let's see whether we, we are able to reach someone. Ping minus I VLAN 13. That is my SVI interface, which belongs to the tenant. And now I'm trying to, to ping my server. That is the, the server I, I will use later on for virtualization purposes, right? That's the IP address of bridge interface or the physical interface or whatever. So it's working. It's, it's, that one is working. Could be worse. So I'm off the hook, right? But you can al always tell my manager afterwards. Too bad, no jokes. That was the first thing my first manager told me. You are not supposed to tell any jokes. Don't even try. Uh, long time. So, okay, what could we do next? We could, um, let's go to the, to the server, SSH um, server 01. Ooh, um, let's see, um, IP route. We have a default route via the management interface, okay, to get some packets from the outside, which is nice. I would put that also in a different verb to have two default routes, might be better. And then I'm, I'm, I'm having some stuff over here. I have a CNI for later, I have a bridge interface for later, um, but um, do I have some namespace for poor people, uh, IP, that namespace? Um, that is for later, that's my Kubernetes stuff. Um, what I can offer you is, is, a, is a quick um, quick environment, um, let's see, something like this, where I create just, ah, Huh. Where I create a namespace, where I create a VE pair, put that VE pair at the end in that namespace. Um, it will get an IP address. 
172, 16, or 101, and I do also have a bridge, um, 1601, and um, now that that IP range is totally unknown to, well, more or less to to the outside world. So we need a static route pointing from our leaf. Um, let's take a look. Um, SSH leaf 01. Mm -hmm. Clear. SSH leaf 01. Um, net show route. I need a route for that tenant, so inside that VRF, and maybe I should I do have a static route pointing here, and if I have a static route pointing, I should I'm running out of time? Ten minutes. Hmm? Ten minutes for seven hours. Ten minutes for seven hours. And I'm out of this. I'm 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 done. It's it's it's. Okay. I, I just want to ping one time, and then then you're relieved. You can you can wake up, and um, all that bad <laughs> dreams are over. <laughs> I wish that some, sometimes true for me. Um, ping minus i VLAN thirteen ten. What was the IP address? One seventy two sixteen o one o one. Ah, it's, it's at least working. So I could do the same basically now with container start, nginx with a replica set of, well, four. Go into the container, take a look at the number, and FRR on that host would announce those routes, those hosts, to the network. Uh, so it would be a collaboration between those two teams. So with that being said, I'm almost, um, I'm almost done. 48 slides or so, so it's, it's, it's doable. No, I'm empty. That would, would be the other one. That's the configuration for BGP and the verbs. Um, in the end, in the end, open networking for me is only to boot an operating system of your choice on your white box switches. For me, it is Netlink because Netlink offers different routing demons to work with your Linux distribution. And for me, it is also the option to use any orchestration tool you're using anyhow for your server and to use telemetry to pick up that information and stream that out. So I hope you have multiple choices um, and there are certainly always new choices coming and going, but to well, take that skill set, uh, I think going for the Linux way is a good choice to stay with the least amount of work, the longest time in business. Um, yeah, one tool set to rule them all, one skill set to rule them all, and um, it's supposed to be simple, boring. The server should be a network switch, or a network switch should be a server. For me, that is my open networking. Thank you so much.